Welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living and our climate. We're now going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Sir David King. Sir David King is originally a chemist and following a lifetime of focusing on science-based policy, he became the UK government's chief scientific advisor from 2000 to 2007 and a special representative for climate change from 2013 to 2017. He has since founded the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge University and the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you, Rachel. As we speak, it's a year from COP26 in Glasgow. At our film's launch event, you voiced some scepticism about progress achievable at COP27. Now that COP is underway in Egypt, what, what are your observations? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that I'm not at COP. I can't be there because I've contracted COVID. Um, mm. But I, I think it's too early to say the first week of a COP meeting is always very much the same. Everyone is just discussing things they've always discussed. We mustn't forget each country is represented on average by 20 official representatives negotiating for them. That means 4,000 negotiators. It's a vast group of people. It always takes to the last few days before anything real emerges. But in terms of what we can expect, this is an African COP. We would like to see a big focus on Africa and uh, what would be proper is to have a commitment from the wealthy world to help the developing world and the South in the transition to uh, move away from fossil fuels, but also to deal with the challenges of climate change that they're faced with. So on that note, the Climate Crisis Advisory Group has published two important contributions during COP27, one focusing on risk assessment and the other on compensation for loss and damage suffered by the Global South. What are your conclusions and who must read these reports? So the, the, the first report is very much based on uh, experts from the risk uh, insurance industry. Um, so the, the insurance and the reinsurance sector where their experts deal with the low probability events that have a, a high outcome. So they will insure you against your house burning down, for example. And when, we, when they look at issues like climate change, they look at it from with different eyes from a scientific perspective. Scientists like myself tend to always try and predict with accuracy the future. These guys are used to looking at percentages and small chances of really bad things happening to allow you to ensure yourself. So it's a different perspective on climate change and it's something that I made use of when I was within government um, and I, I took a, a group of actuaries from these companies to India and China and we worked with those governments on what climate risks were likely to deliver for them but also what were the unlikely things that would have a big impact. Um, and I, I think the, the work that we did uh, produced a long lasting effect in both countries in terms of the seriousness with which they took climate change. So uh, yesterday we published a, a report which is, is dealing with the transition away from fossil fuels and the, the question of the uh, impact that it's all having or around the world, the, uh, the, the impact on, in particular, the poorer countries of the world. Uh, now, what, what, is, what is essentially needed is, once again, this issue of the wealthy world stepping in, not only to take all the measures they need to take, reduce emissions deeply, rapidly, and much more quickly than they are now, but we also need the wealthy world to step in and help the poorer world 
that is suffering. If we look at Pakistan, for example, at the moment, the floods in Pakistan we know are driven by climate change. These are events that are coupled together with the extreme weather events happening right around the world. And these events all follow what is happening in the Arctic Circle region, where the Arctic Circle is now heating up at four times the rate of the rest of the planet because of the loss of summer ice over the Arctic Sea. And what we're seeing is that the whole weather system of the world is in transition and the loss and damage incurred around the world is simply enormous. We're looking at quite in excess of a quarter to half a trillion dollars over the last three to four years. What, what is to be done to help the developing countries manage loss and damage? And that's really a big focus of this part of the report. You mentioned there that the, about the Arctic ice melting. And I know that with your work with the Center for Climate Repair, you talk about ambitious ideas like refreezing the Arctic. But how could we actually do that? Well, let me say at once, uh, yes, this may sound like an ambitious idea, but it's also something that is imperative. If, if we should reduce emissions to zero tomorrow, all of the irreversible things that are happening in the Arctic Circle region will still happen. The, the loss of ice from Greenland will continue irreversibly and the loss of methane from the permafrost regions in the land masses around the Arctic Circle will also be lost. The first giving rise to a sea level rise of maybe seven meters and the second giving rise quite possibly to temperature rises globally of five to eight degrees centigrade. We know that we haven't got time to reduce emissions rapidly enough and to remove greenhouse gases rapidly enough to avoid this happening. So we have to refreeze the Arctic. To answer your question, the focus we have is always on natural processes. How can we harness natural processes to refreeze the Arctic. When a white cloud covers the sun, we all know that we feel cooler standing in the shade of the cloud. Can we cover the Arctic Circle region for three months in the year? These are the three months when the sun has moved up to the North Pole region and is heating the region up. Uh, how can we cover that region with white cloud cover simply during those three months. During the winter period, when the sun has gone down to the North Pole region, during the winter period, ice regrows over the Arctic Sea where it's previously melted, but that layer of ice melts within days of the sun coming back. If we can shade that area, we hope to keep the ice there and then year after year, let it build up until we have completed the deep and rapid emissions reduction and brought greenhouse gases levels down to something that is manageable for the future of humanity. Fantastic ideas like this um, seem very futuristic and perhaps can't be implemented as quickly as we need in response to the emergency. Do you think we rely too much on future innovation rather than dealing with immediate limitation and mitigation? Well, as I said, let's suppose we did everything to mitigate by tomorrow. Mm. We still have all the problems of the melting ice. We still have all the problems of what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. That part of the world's climate system has currently tipped. It's gone past its tipping point. And I'm going to use the analogy of a tipping point with an avalanche. Snow builds up on a mountainside for a long, long time, big, heavy snow lying on the mountain, and suddenly it slides down and an avalanche occurs. That's irreversible. But if we can refreeze the Arctic, we can at least buy time while we remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere at scale and while we switch away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. You founded and chaired Independent SAGE, giving scientists a public forum in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and allowing for engagement with science instead of negotiations behind closed doors. 
And you've now applied that model to the climate emergency with the Climate Crisis Advisory Group involving a global group of scientists. So the pandemic showed us that fast and sweeping change is definitely possible, that governments can lead, that public will follow. So what is needed so that governments, the economy and individuals can respond to the oil pandemic with the same sense of urgency? Rachel, that's a very, very good question, because in fact, if you look at the COVID-19 outbreak and evaluate how much countries around the world, and of course, I'm particularly talking about the wealthy countries and the rapidly emerging countries like uh, China and India, how much did they spend in total managing that outbreak? The estimate is $13 trillion, $13 trillion. How much are we currently spending on uh, in, in terms of international expenditure to manage the climate crisis? It's a tiny fraction of that number. Now, obviously, we need to step it up and match that sort of $13 trillion number if we're going to manage this much, much bigger crisis. It's much bigger, not only in terms of its impact on our economy, but it's also bigger in terms of its impact on humanity. This, this is a challenge that could mean the end of our civilization if we don't invest in handling it properly. I'm personally just also fascinated in the way that the, the public respond, that governments led and created actions, and then the public were agreeable to following rules, you know, had some sense of society and responsibility. And what do you think caused that and, and the success of that? And how can we trans, what can we learn and transfer when we're communicating these ideas and the, the urgency of the climate crisis to the public? So the, the first thing to say is that when we're faced with a disease outbreak as, as, as a killer disease as COVID-19 is, um, and you know, we, we only have to look at outbreaks of similar diseases such as Ebola in Western Africa, uh, we, the Western countries, assist those countries by sending our experts out there and we help them to isolate people who've got the disease from everybody else. First lesson, when you've got a transmittable disease, isolate those who've got it. And this is very difficult in many parts of the world, but we managed that in West Africa. We contained Ebola, and that was a, a global effort. When we understand the nature of a disease, we know that everybody is at risk. And so we going into West Africa is not only to help the West Africans, it's also to help ourselves so that we don't get challenged by the same disease. Now, I would say, unfortunately, with COVID-19, the response was terribly, terribly tardy. And we were still allowing plane loads of people to come here from around the world, including China. We were still allowing, when we discovered the outbreak had happened in Italy, we were still allowing people to come from Italy to Britain. We didn't isolate countries, we didn't isolate people, we did not act properly. And the disease grew around the world in a way that should never have happened if we could have isolated it all much earlier on. The Chinese did a good job in isolating it. I would say many of the Eastern countries did a good job in isolating it, but we didn't. We allowed it to spread. And the reason was because we thought it would hurt our economies. And then we go into lockdown. Now, lockdown is an extreme measure, which again, should never have happened. If you can isolate people with the disease, you don't need lockdown. Now, that's enough about that. The point is that with a disease, we know how it spreads. We know what we should do to control it. And yes, we, do, we were developing new technologies for vaccine production, and we stepped in with that, up the rate of development, and produced the vaccines that have been a tremendous help in overwhelming the disease. But if we look at climate change, the response is much more tardy. And the, re the reason is, in part at least, the power of the fossil fuel companies. The fossil fuel companies around the world have behaved in such a way as to denigrate the science of climate change. Uh, it's not just the jury is out, they're actually saying it's a load of nonsense. 
And so what, what we've had since 1992, that meeting in Rio, when all countries came together to discuss the issue of climate change, since then, and even at that meeting, we've had oil companies forming a cabal to fight against any action that might lose them their business. Now, <coughs> the oil companies are going to lose their business because they haven't yet understood that they need to use their financial strength to switch away from oil. If these oil companies were leading the way into alternatives to oil, gas and coal, we would be out of this. But they haven't taken that view. They've taken the view that this is a threat to their livelihood and their business. And so, <coughs> excuse me, and so the, the result is that we have been faced with massive skepticism, particularly in America, where the oil lobby is extremely powerful and has, I'm afraid, many senators and congressmen in their pockets. You asked me how things are going at COP27. And we had the heads of governments there for the first two days. And I was following that quite closely. The heads of governments were very largely, I'm afraid, meeting and exchanging views on things that are at the top of their minds. And at the top of their minds is not climate change, it's other issues. Obviously high on their agendas, because they want to talk to, a country A wants to talk to country B about managing a particular problem, but nothing to do with climate change. We, I'm afraid, are missing leadership from the very top on climate change. When I was working with Tony Blair, I could tell you, and I think the whole world at that time understood this, that Blair and then Brown were leading the world on action needed on climate change. Who was blocking the action that we were trying to push through? It was the United States. All the way through, it was the United States. So we, we had a, a G8 meeting held up in Scotland where our prime minister was in the presidency and he decided to lead on climate change. And so we, the people working for our heads of governments, were meeting to try and thrash out an agreement before the meeting happened. And the United States asked to see whatever the rest of us agreed last of oil, last of all, and then redlined every single sentence that meant real action. That's, that's the United States was blocking action. Your statement about the urgent need for action within the next five years is one of the core messages of our film. And many of us feel overwhelmed and terrified. What are the things that give you hope? We have a very full strategy for developing the future for humanity. And that full strategy is described in terms of our three R's. The first R, deep and rapid emissions reduction. The second R is quite simply remove excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. To expand on that, today we're in excess of 500 parts per million in the atmosphere. 420 is carbon dioxide, the rest is mainly methane. Often people forget about the methane contribution. Over 500 parts per million compared with 270 in the pre-industrial period. Quite simply, anything over 350 parts per million will leave humanity in a very, very poor position as we move forward. So we have to pull it down, all the way down to 350 parts per million. The third R is refreeze the Arctic. We have to buy time by refreezing the Arctic in the shorter period of time. Well, thank you, Sir David King, for joining us today and for all that you've been doing, and I hope you feel better soon. So David is a Thank key you. contributor to the oil machine, which is now showing in cinemas and at community events across the UK. You can also contact us about hosting a screening for your organization, your business, campus, or community, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org. <laughs>